on out. You know, head on out for your time of learning together. Go enjoy. Welcome here this morning. I know it's not easy when we spring ahead to get up. I'm not a morning person, I'll be honest with you. And so this morning has been a bit of, all right, God, I know you got this because mornings aren't my thing. Mornings are not my thing. So uh, it's good to be together, though, with you, worshiping God, singing, having fellowship, praying together, and now opening the Word of God together. And so if you have your Bibles with me, you can, you can, with you, you can open them to Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 18 through 27 this morning, page 841 of the Pew Bible in front of you. And we're going to take a look at a story of Peter's confession and Jesus' call. And so this morning, as, as we get going, I just want to ask you a question for you to think about here this morning. And it's simply, how do you feel? How do you feel? It gets your feelings involved. So how do you feel when you ask something to do, someone to do something beneficial for themselves and they don't listen? You have the greatest intention for the person or the people in your life, and so you want them to do something beneficial that could be life-giving, that could help them wherever they're at in their life, but instead of actually listening to you, they, they do something else. And this morning, like I said, we're going to take a look at Peter's proclamation and then Jesus' call to us as followers to follow. And so I want to ask you, how do you feel when you look at the people in your life and try to do something beneficial for them? And they, they just disregard it. Like if you're a parent, you have lots of examples of this. And I'm not just saying things to pick on my kids because when I was a kid, my parents could say the exact same things as, as I'm going to say here this morning. But as a parent, right? Your kids have a long week. They go from point A to point B to point C, or maybe even you do that. And then evening comes, and you try to give them something that's beneficial for them. Why don't you go to bed early? And it seems like a punishment or, or something that, you know, what they don't want to do, right? It, it's like, no, no, I'm actually trying to help you out. You know, you sleep, you're going to feel better. Or, or maybe your kid has a crash. They get upset about something. They don't know how to calm down. As my wife's been teaching me in a book that we read, we have to first connect and then redirect, but um, I'm not very good at connecting and redirecting, but uh, um, maybe you connect with them and then you're like, hey, you know what's going to really help you right now? Going off for some quiet time. But again, it seems like a punishment, right? It seems like a punishment. Or for you younger folk here, you know what? Uh, too much screen time. Maybe your parents are trying to say, hey, you know what? We're going to cut down on that screen time, even maybe for adults as well, because it's not beneficial for you, right? It feels like a punishment. It feels like a punishment. When Fraser Health comes out and says kids under the age of five should only have one hour of screen time and kids over the age of five, you guys are going to like this one, only two hours of screen time a day, you know what, it feels like a punishment, but, but there's benefits for that. Helps us sleep better, helps us become less aggressive, less irritated, like all these things. I, I found it funny, I read an article, I think it was last week or the week before, in China who helped invent TikTok or now owns TikTok, they don't even actually have TikTok in their country. Right? It, it makes me laugh because they know that too much screen time is not good for anybody, but they're trying to get us in North America addicted to it so that we watch it nonstop. If you were under the age of 14 in China, you're allowed 40 minutes a day on their TikTok version of, I think it's like Doyen or something like that, and all you get on there, you get educational videos, you get to go walk through museums, you get to learn how to be a good citizen, and 40 minutes and you're done. You're done go insane. I know you guys would go insane. You're like, 40 minutes? Yeah, right. 40 minutes in each hour. That's what I do. But, but here's the thing, right? So often, so often we're like, you know what? We hear about things that are beneficial for us, but instead of actually listening and saying, hey, you know what? I, I'm going to do this because I know they have my good intentions for them. We, we try to do something else. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at Peter's confession and then Jesus' call to us as followers, or if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, what, what is he calling us to do? And what he's calling us to do, it's, it's beneficial for us. It's not something that's labor-intensive or why do I have to do it? No, it, it's, it's for our good. And so this morning, like I said, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start out, and we're going to start out in, in verse 18. And we're going to read this in sections again today. And so starting in verse 18, it says this. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets of long ago who has come back to life. 
But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone, and he said, the son must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Let me pray with you. Father God, I pray that as we're here this morning, and maybe some of us are tired. I know, I know I'm a little tired. I pray that wherever we're at mentally, you will help us hear from you what you want us to hear. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here, you are moving, and you have something to say to each and every one of us, and it's not supposed to be heavy, but it's supposed to be life-giving. And so, God, I pray that as you speak to us this morning, we will hear what you have for us to hear. As I always pray, God, help me to remember what you want me to remember, help me to forget what you want me to forget, and if there's something new that you want to speak through me, Lord, let me be faithful to say it. Lead us in our time together now. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so this morning, we're going to go back to that question we've been asking all the way through this series, and it's simply this. What does Luke want most excellent Theophilus? What does he want the people of the day? What does he want us to know by inserting these stories into his gospel? And it's simply this, who Jesus is and what he came to do. We're coming back to two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, there was somebody that asked the exact same question, who is Jesus? Do we remember who that was? Two weeks ago? Pilate? No. Close. No. Two weeks ago, there was this, this elite man. His, his name is Herod. And Herod asked the exact same question, who is Jesus? And out of Herod, we said, it doesn't matter if you're the marginalized that are living amongst Jesus' day or whether you are elite like Herod, everybody has to figure out what to do with Jesus. And that's the same thing that's true for us today. Because Jesus sits down with his followers and he says, once again, who do people say I am? And we get that echo from earlier on when Herod asked the exact same question in Luke 9. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say a prophet of long ago. And so now Jesus sits down with his 12 by themselves, people that have been following him, people that have seen him do miracles, heal people, cast out demons. Just last week, we talked about him feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, and now he intently looks at them, and he says, okay, you know what everybody else says about me, but who do you say I am? And I think Jesus has the same question for us today, too. If you've grown up in the church, if you've heard a lot about Jesus, you know when we celebrate his birthday, you know when we celebrate his death and resurrection, you have some verses that you know about him, but, but the question still is, who do you say he is? And Jesus looks at the twelve. And they recite to him, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say prophet of long ago, and he looks right at them and he says, but what about you? What about you? Doesn't matter if you're marginalized, doesn't matter if you have more than enough, it doesn't matter if you've been around Jesus throughout your lifetime, you still need to make the choice of what to do with Jesus. And so he looks at them and says, who do you say I am? And Peter looks at him as the spokesperson for the group and he says, you are the Christ of God. That's a big, big statement. You are the Christ of God. Or as it says in Matthew's version of this, in Matthew 16, he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And it says, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Church, we have to figure out what to do with Jesus. Is he Savior and Lord, or as he, like we said two weeks ago with the, tri, with the C.S. Lewis trilemma, is he a liar or a lunatic? You have to figure out what to do with Jesus. And so Peter makes this proclamation, you are, you are the Christ of God, right? Christ isn't just Jesus' last name, I want you to know that, right? Maybe when you're growing up, you're like, oh, that's Jesus' last name, Right? No, no, it's not his last name. Christ in Greek means anointed or anointed one. 
The, the difference is in Hebrew where, where Matthew is writing to a Jewish group. He uses the word Messiah, which again means to be anointed or the anointed one. You see, that's, that's what this word means. Jesus is the one that's anointed by God to come and what? Bring salvation. He is the one that this, these, 12, these 12 Jewish men have been waiting for all their lives. This is the one that their parents were waiting for, their grandparents were waiting for. The one that would come and establish David's throne forever. This is, this is who is standing before them. And maybe for them, they're getting pretty excited because they, they're, they're under Roman oppression. They're being pushed down. They're, they're being exhausted of their, of their money and so they're starting to get really excited and they're thinking about scriptures that come before, ahead of them. And maybe they're thinking of, of Zechariah 9, 9 where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, is humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. That word gets me every time. My head says something else. So they're, they're, they're picturing warrior Jesus coming. This is what they've been waiting for. But Jesus wants his disciples there's some, to know there's something so much more that he's coming for. Not, not, not to establish his earthly reign right now, but he wants everyone to know about the kingdom of God. He wants everyone to know about what he has come to do. And so he looks at them and he says, Jesus strictly warns them not to tell anyone. Don't tell anyone that you just called me the anointed one. Don't tell anyone that you just called me the, the one that's going to bring salvation. I want you to know this so that as we go through the next few chapters, as we go through the next few seasons of life, you know who I am. But I don't want you to tell anyone why. Not because he's embarrassed about who he is and what he's come to do. Not because he has a secret agenda. No, he, he knows that the people of the day have been waiting for a savior. And they will jump behind anybody that calls themselves the Messiah and try to storm Rome. And he's like, no, no, no. I have something bigger than taking down the Romans. I've come on a mission. And you say, well, what is his mission? Well, what did he come to do? He spells it out for them. It says, and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Not warrior king. Sheep headed to the slaughter. You know that, that sheep picture that we've had up all the way through the series that we have downstairs? It's, it's Jesus coming on his mission of reconciliation. And reconciliation really means to reunite. Reunite us with God. Bring us back to that right relationship with God. That's what Jesus came to do. And as Peter declares this, Jesus says, okay, let me let, me let you in on the plan. This is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die. But on the third day, this is the good news, I'm going to raise again. Colossians 1.20 says it like this. It says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by God, by the blood of his cross. That's what Jesus came to do. And I want to ask you this morning, do you believe that? Do you know that? It's so much bigger than him coming as warrior king, him as the lamb going to the slaughter to die in our place, to bring us and make us right with God. That, that, that's huge. I know everybody's waiting for the second coming where Jesus comes back at the battle of Armageddon, but again, when he shows up, the war is over because he is King Jesus. But he came to make us right with God. What are you going to do with Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Whether you're here live or online, who is Jesus to you? Because he came to save you from your sin. He came to make you right with God. I need you to know the gospel this morning. I know we share it lots here, but I want you to know the gospel. If it's your first time hearing it or you've heard it many times, I want you to figure out what to do with Jesus. And I want you to know this, that God loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for you. He wants you to have peace. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 10.10, one of our life verses, it says, right, The thief comes to only kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and life to the fullest. Romans 5 says, We have peace with God through Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And I want you to know that this morning. I don't know how you're living your life. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if you're here this morning and you don't know God, he wants you to have purpose in life. He wants you to have full life. He wants you to have peace. And whatever you're trying to do in this world, it's, it's not going to get you that peace. And so, so God came up with a plan. But before we get to that plan, let me tell you what happened. Sin separated us from God. I know we don't like to believe this, but, you know, back in the Garden of Eden, they were given one rule. We always think, you know what, it'd be so much easier if there was only one rule to follow. Adam and Eve had one rule to follow. Don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of fruit of good and evil, because when you eat it, you will die. Along comes Lucifer, the serpent, and says, hey, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. And that's our sin. That's our sin issue. Our sin issue is simply we want to say what is right, what is wrong. We want to say what is good and what is evil. We want to do whatever's good for us, whatever feels right. And God's saying, no, no, no. You know what? I have what's best in store for you. You know, follow me. And so sin separated us. And Romans 3.23 tells us, you know what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But here's the thing. God came up with a plan. As Jesus tells his followers, you know what? I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. Jesus took our place. Romans 5, 8 says, well, we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's good news. We can't save ourselves, and Jesus lets his followers in on the master plan, but he wants us to know this too. You know what? Well, we are still in rebellion. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross for us. Not only did he die on the cross for us, three days later, guess what happened? He rose from the dead, conquering sin, conquering Satan, conquering all the things that are separating us from God. But here's the truth. You've got to choose what to do with Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? You can choose him today. In Romans 10, it tells us if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So Luke comes along and he lays us out in this story. He says, hey, what, what I want you to know here this morning, whether it was the people over 2,000 years ago, Theophilus or us, I want you to know who Jesus is and what he's come to do. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I want to challenge you as the Holy Spirit moves in your life to figure out what to do with Jesus. And maybe today is the day you confess him as Savior and Lord. But maybe you're here this morning and you know Jesus as Savior and Lord. You know him. Well, here's the call for us who know him as Savior and Lord. This is the call for us. Luke 23 to 26, it says, Then he said to them all, if anyone would, like, would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. We're going to pause there. We're going to leave that last verse just for the end because it's a fun one. So what does Luke want, most excellent Theophilus? What does he want the people of the day? What does he want us to know by inserting this into the story? And it's simply, Jesus wants followers, not fans. I know it's a tough truth to hear, but, but Jesus wants us to be followers and truly committed to him. And he doesn't want us just to be fans. We'll come back to verse 23 in a minute, but those, those verses in 24, 25, and 26, it, it really challenges us, us of how we're living our lives. And are we truly dying for Jesus? Are we really giving up our lives for him? Or are we trying to put one foot in this world and one foot in following Jesus? And here's the thing, Jesus doesn't want fans. Like I said earlier, he doesn't want us to know his stats. Favorite verse, John 3, 16, right? John 10, 10, Psalm 1, 19, 20. He doesn't want us just to know those events that happened in our lives. See, as North Americans, we're really good at knowing stats, right? If you follow any kind of sport, I'm sure you know the baseball, football, or hockey players' stats. You're like, man, I know so-and-so has so many points this year. They had the greatest season. Maybe you're not into sports. You follow Survivor or The Bachelorette on your phone, and you're like, I can tell you all about those people as well, right? We're really good at knowing about people, But Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want you just to know about me. I want you to follow me. Let me read you that call again. For whoever wants to save his life, he will lose it. We're so worried. We're so worried about losing our life. That's the number one thing for us. We're like, you know what? What's going to happen to me when I die? 
I, I don't want to lose my life. But he says, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. It's an upside-down kingdom. You know what? We, we can't be saved in anyone else or anything else other than Jesus. And so when we finally get to the end of our rope and we're like, you know what? I'm trying A, B, C, and D to find life and none of it's working. Guess what's going to work? Is when we finally surrender that and give it all to Jesus. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Church, it's tough words to hear. It's tough words for me to hear, but, but this is what Jesus wants. He doesn't want us to be fans. He wants us to be followers. He wants us to give up our lives and say, you know what, Jesus? What I'm doing right now to try to find life, to try to find peace, it's not working. Only in you, in what you've done on the cross through your death and resurrection, will give me life. Only in you. You are the only way for full life. And we believe that here at River of Life Church. That's, our, that's one of our life verses. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life to the full. Church, will we believe him? Will we follow him? Will we look more like him? And as you think about that, I want to ask you, do you look like Jesus? Do you and I look more like Jesus than we did a year ago? Two years ago, three years ago? Are we following Jesus? You're like, I don't know if I can do this by myself. Here's the beauty. When we surrender our life to Jesus as Savior and Lord, he gives us his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit comes into us and he helps us love Jesus better. He helps us follow the ways of Jesus better. And so, I want to ask you, what can we do as we follow Jesus? Jesus wants to give you and me success. And so he tells us, this is what it can look like. First thing you can do is you can deny yourself. We don't like that word. Especially not in our world. We love, we love instant gratification. Anything that might take some time. We, denial? No, no. Don't want that. But Jesus says, you know what? If you want to come after me, you must deny yourself. And it doesn't just mean, and I think this is where we've gotten it wrong so, so long in Christianity, it's just a list of do's and don'ts. Right? So often we think about ourselves as, I don't do A, B, C, and D. I know the old saying, and I say it every now and then, and I don't know if it's acceptable in church, but when I was growing up, it always used to say, don't smoke, swear, or chew, or go with girls that do. And so they used to always say that, don't know if it's acceptable in church, you can smack me afterwards if I have to, but, but see, here's the thing, we always thought about the things that we don't do to follow Jesus. We don't do all these things, and so that's what denial is. It's about taking away life. It's about taking away all those good things in life. So I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. And then we become so exhausted by not doing that we miss out on life. But in reality, I read it like this this last week. If we look at denial like this, I think it will help us as we move forward. Denial, this means that as Christians, we will not set our desires and our wills against the right Christ has in our lives. If we look at that through that lens... Instead of saying, deny, 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 we say, Jesus is Lord, and when we confess him as Lord, we now say, he has right in my life to speak the good things into it. Right? Here's the thing. Jesus wants what's good for you, but it goes against our North American way. Right? Follow your heart. If it feels good, do it. Let me be honest with you. If sin did not feel good in the moment, none of us would do it. But because in that moment, it feels good, but then it leads to death and despair and all these other things, we all of a sudden say, oh, you know what? I shouldn't have done that. But Jesus is coming along and he's saying, I have a better way. And if you choose my way, it's better. If you deny yourself and say, I have right to speak what is good into your life and you choose that, it'll change the way you live. If you don't believe me, let's just quickly go to Galatians 5. Verses 19 to 23, you could read the whole thing if you want, live by the Spirit, uh, Galatians 5, 13 to 26. Paul lays it out like this. He talks about this worldly desire. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, those who live out life this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. But yet, a lot of those things, you know what, not the really bad ones, there's times where we desire things and we're like, oh, you know what, that's just what my heart wants. But if we moved on from there, Jesus says, you know what, the reason why I'm asking you to deny yourself is because I want to speak life into you. I want, to, I want to show you the better way. And he says, what is the better way? My spirit within you. And when my spirit's within you, he gives you the one fruit. I know we read them as many fruits, but he gives you the one fruit, which is the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we deny ourselves and so we choose, choose the Jesus way, you know what? Life starts to change. Think about it. Instead of anger choosing love and joy, how much different would your day, would your day be? Instead of lust, you choose self-control. How, how different would your day be? Instead of, instead of bitterness, we choose kindness and peace. You know what? Jesus' way is better. He's not saying deny those things just for the sake of not having life. He's saying, no, I have something so much better. Will you allow me to speak into your life? Will you allow me the authority that, that I should have in your life if you are calling me Lord? So the first challenge to you as we follow Jesus is will we deny ourselves? And then he says, daily take up your cross. I know when we look at this, we think, well, do I need to go die on a cross? No, no, it's not literal. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol for the people of the day. We can't die on a cross and save ourselves just like anybody in this room can't die on a cross and save you. No, no, Jesus died on the cross for everyone who believes in him and he will give them life because he has the power over death, over sin, over darkness. He did that for you. But he's giving this imagery for the people of the day that when the Jewish soldiers came into town, they'd throw one bar of the cross down to the criminal that is going to be crucified. And they say, you know what, pick up that bar now and carry it all the way to your death. And everybody in that town, everybody in that village that saw this happen, they would know that guy is on a one-way journey and he's not coming back. And Jesus is asking his followers, he's saying, will you be on a one-way journey to me? I know in our world we want to go say one-way Jesus, but we're looking for like five different options. No, no, there's one way. It's no different than going down a one-way street. Guess what? You're supposed to go down it one way. I just thought of this before I stood up here this morning. I remember going down a one-way street with my brother in Regina, and that was freaky because you're only supposed to be going one way. When you're dodging traffic trying to make it to the end to get out of there, it's not good. It's not life-giving. But Jesus says, I want you to go one way. One way. Take up your cross daily. One way daily. That's the challenge. That's the challenge that, that Luke adds in there, that one day daily take up your cross and follow him. In church, I want to ask you, will you and I, will we daily choose Jesus? Will we wake up each morning and say, Jesus, I'm on a one-way journey to you. Don't let me veer to the right or the left. Don't let me think that there's many options like the world keeps on trying to push out. There's many ways. No, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Let me, let me go one way towards you because I know you're all life-giving. With the Holy Spirit's help, will you and I, will we wake up each day and say, no, one-way journey to Jesus? One way as I follow him. And the last thing, you know what Jesus is calling us to do is just follow. Gandhi says, I, I like their Christ, but I, I, like, I like their Christ, but I don't like their Christian. Their Christian looks nothing like their Christ. And that, that's a sad reality for the North American church and for the church around the world is that we don't look anything like Christ at times. I'm not saying this is true for everyone. But it's, but it's a challenge to us that will we be followers of Jesus? Will we read what he is calling us to do here in his word and actually live it out? And not just say, oh, it's good head knowledge or heart knowledge. No, no. Will we actually take it and live it out? So will you ask yourself, am, am I following Jesus? Do I look any different than I did two years ago, five years ago, six months ago? And as you think about that, this, none of this is supposed to be heavy burden or to pull you down and make you feel like you're not good enough or not doing enough. No, none of us can do this without the Holy Spirit's help. If you said yes to Jesus, I believe that he has given you his Holy Spirit to indwell in you so that we can live victorious Christian lives. And in John 14, 15 to 31, it talks about what that looks like. But I'm going to read you John 14, 15 to 17. It says this, as Jesus calls his disciples to follow he says this, he says, if you love me, 
If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor who will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. But you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be within you. Church, Jesus is rooting for us. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, if we call ourselves disciples, if we call ourselves little of Christ, he's not saying, I want you to fail. He's like, no, I want you to shine bright in the world. I want you to succeed. I want you to live me out. I want you to, I want to, sh- I want you to show the people around you you're not just denying because those things are, are bad, but because I have something better. And he's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given me the Holy Spirit too to help us in this world. Will you and I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your spirit and dwelling within me. Thank you for what you do for me each and every day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so this morning I want to ask you, will, will, will you ask God today to help you not be a fan but a follower? And will you deny yourself? Will you daily take up your cross and will you follow? I'm going to read one last verse that will tee up Pastor Josiah's sermon next week. Luke 9, 27 says this, I tell you the truth, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. What does Luke want most excellent Theophilus? What does he want the people of the day? What does he want us to know by inserting this verse that confuses us many times? Is he's showing them that God will show some of them the kingdom before they die. I want to, I want to challenge you and I want to challenge myself. Uh, when we come across tough verse Verses, don't just brush them under the rug and say, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go on with my day and do something else, and uh, hopefully one day it'll make sense. But we, we can dig in. We have very, very, we have lots of wise men and women that have come before us, that have put together commentaries, that have uh, wrestled with these truths and said, okay, what does this actually look like? And I've been honest with you guys, the one thing I, I do like going through the Gospel of Luke at the pace that we're going through is that when I get tough verses, I can't shy away from them. And so I thought I'd better practice what I preach and not shy away from this one this week. And so you might say, well, what does Jesus mean? Is he lying to us? Did he misunderstand when he said this because, you know what, they all died, right? So what, what does he actually mean? And so I'll just walk you through quick, quickly, quickly, I promise, six quick possible answers to what Jesus could mean here. Two of them hold the most validity, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many scholars that have come before me. But the first one, obviously... Um, Did it mean Jesus' second coming? Well, you know what? We're 2,000 years later and nobody's best friends with John or with Peter or with James or any of the other disciples. And so obviously he did not mean literally you're going to be standing here 2,000 years later when the second coming comes and you're going to be physically alive, right? Whether spiritually alive, we can debate that later. But but physically staying alive till he came back the second time, that's not what Jesus means. Well, then maybe he means the resurrection and ascension of Christ, And he could mean this, he could mean this, because when he died and rose again, there was only 11 of them there, not 12, because Judas went off and killed himself. And so he could mean that, but again, many scholars say, "Ah, that's probably not right, but again, this isn't a salvation issue, so we don't have to worry too much about it, but it's just wrestling through the text. The third one is maybe the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Again, there's 11 of them there, not 12, so okay, he could mean this, but again, they looked at it through a few different lenses and they said, it, it can't be that. It can't be that. Well, what could it mean? The spread of the early church? Maybe. How about the destruction of Jerusalem? Now, Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, and for a lot of scholars, this holds a lot of validity because at the fall of Jerusalem, some of the disciples would already be dead, some would still be living, and at this time, the old order of things would be broken down. So, the Old Testament covenant would be turned upside down because in Jerusalem being overthrown, the temple would have been overthrown. There'd be no more room for sacrifice, all these things. And so a lot of scholars will hold on to this and say, you know what, this is a good point. This could be where you land. Again, not a salvation issue, but as we wrestle through, it could mean this. The one that most people fall upon is the transfiguration. And the reason why most people follow upon the transfiguration, and Pastor Josiah will tell you all about it next week, he's been studying really hard, so he's he's really excited for that one, um, is is because three reasons. Number one, that idea of of them saying, let me quote it right so I don't just go from my notes here, he says, 
I tell you the truth, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. That phrase, kingdom of God, can be translated royal splendor or glory of God. And you will see next week, I don't want to do spoiler alerts, you'll see next week that there are some that are privy to see the splendor of God on display. The second reason why many people lean to this is because there's only three people, I'm not going to tell you who, show up at the transfiguration with Jesus and there's some other people that come along, not, not spoiling anything, got to keep it ready for you next week. And lastly, the reason why people lean towards it, talking about the transfiguration is because both in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, guess what story follows after the confession and the call? The story of the transfiguration. And so, my challenge in all that isn't to bore you guys, because I know you guys are like glazing over, you're like, man. I, my challenge is just simply, when we, when we get to tough verses, instead of us just being like, no, I'm going to just plow through it like it never happened, you know what? There's a lot of godly people that have come before us that can help us wrap our minds around what could that mean. And so don't just glaze over it that it doesn't mean anything. Uh, dig in, see what it has to happen. And so I'm going to wrap up my time. And so this morning as I wrap up my time, I'm going to call the worship team forward. And I pray that this morning, as the Holy Spirit moved in our midst, you will know who Jesus is and what he came to do. And I also pray that this morning, if you are here, you, you will have felt the call to to be a follower of Jesus, not a fan. And none of that's to guilt you. Let me be honest with you. I don't want to guilt anybody into the kingdom of God. I don't want to guilt anybody into deny, die, and follow. I want want you to have a real conversation with Jesus and say, what does it look like as I live my daily life? Not trying to put rules and regulations on you. I'm trying to say, hey, you know, what does this look like as we call ourselves followers of Jesus? And so this morning, we're going to make it practical. Again, just challenges that you can do throughout the week. And the first thing I'm going to challenge you with this week is just figure out who Jesus is to you. Is Jesus Savior and Lord, or is he something else? The second thing I want to challenge you with is, if you're a follower of Jesus, and you know him as Savior and Lord, take some time this week to read his crucifixion. Read about his death and his resurrection. And spend some time saying, thank you for doing that for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for willingly going to the cross in my place. If you're not, or you don't know Jesus yet, I want to challenge you to read about what Jesus has done for you. And lastly, with the Holy Spirit's help, take some time this week to ask him to show you, are there areas in your life that you need to deny because they're bringing you death and not life? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you show you that are there ways that you need to daily die and take up your cross and say one way, not many ways to Jesus. And lastly, just what does it look like being a follower of Jesus? Holy Spirit, do I look any different than the world around me? Let me pray with you. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for living in us and through us. And I thank you, Jesus, that you came to die for us. And if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, I pray that today will be the day that they choose you. And if they're not ready to choose you yet, I pray that they will go to a friend, a family member, a coworker, somebody, and just start asking questions about you. Because no matter who you are on this side of eternity, we need to figure out what to do with you, Jesus. And so I just pray that as your spirit moves, hearts will respond. And I pray that this morning, if we do know you as Savior and Lord, that we will choose you every day. That we won't just have head knowledge about you, but we'll have heart knowledge and we'll say, I want to follow. I want to follow. I want to wake up today. I want to deny myself, not because I want a list of things I can't do, but because I know your ways are better, Jesus. I want to take up my cross because there's only one way to finding life to the full, and that's through you, Jesus. And so I pursue you as your disciple and help me to follow. Help me to feed the poor. Help me to pray for those in need. Help me to preach about the kingdom through words and actions. And help me to love. Help me to love like you did, Jesus. Help me to love the marginalized. Help me to love the people in my class. Help me to love people above me. Help me to pray for my politicians and leaders. Help me to love, love, love. God, I pray that this week through our words and actions we can point people to you. In your name we pray, Jesus.